Hello, everyone. Welcome to this webinar on the growing humanitarian crisis in Gaza. The event is jointly hosted by the Kroc Institute for International Peace Studies at the University of Notre Dame and PRIO, the Peace Research Institute, Oslo. This is the third in a series of webinars on Gaza that we've organized. And if you're interested, you'll find links to the recordings of the previous webinars on the Kroc um, website. Our discussion today focuses on a, an acute, severe, prolonged, ongoing crisis, humanitarian and political and security crisis in Gaza. After four months of attacks and occupation by the Israeli Defense Force, Gaza has, in the words of a senior United Nations official, become a place of death and despair. The invasion was a response to the brutal massacre of Israelis by Hamas on October 7, 2023. In that massacre, over 1,100 people were killed and 240 were taken hostage. Some, but not all of the hostages have been released. Today, over 30,000 Palestinians have been killed and more than 2 million people are experiencing acute and sustained humanitarian stress. Hospitals are overwhelmed, infectious diseases are spreading, there is mounting risk of famine, and daily life is filled with extreme danger, fear, and trauma. Humanitarian agencies are struggling to provide relief. The situation has been greatly complicated by allegations that several staff working for the UN Relief and Works Agency for Palestinian Refugees in the Near East, the acronym is UNRWA, participated in the Hamas attack on Israel. In light of these allegations, a number of countries suspended financial support to UNRWA. To discuss these issues, we have a really fantastic lineup of panelists and experts. We have Lenny Stenseth, who is Director General of the Norwegian Ministry of Foreign Affairs and previously Deputy Director of UNRWA. We have in Majek and Donmi, sorry, but I still struggle with the surname, who appeared at our very first webinar on Gaza calling for a humanitarian ceasefire there. Ben is Chief of Staff of UNRWA. And we have Alaa Tatir, who is Senior Researcher and Director of the Stockholm International Peace Research Institute at SIPRI, uh, Director of the Middle East and North Africa Programme. And he's also a global fellow at PRIO. My friend Christian Berg Hopweiken, I will participate in the discussion and also make closing remarks. He is research professor and director of the Middle East Center at PRIO. We've asked each of the panelists to make initial inputs of 10 minutes, and then we're going to have a discussion. They have been invited to speak their minds. Um, they're welcome to dis disagree with each other. They're welcome to disagree with the way I framed the event. Uh, this is a rich, open, free discussion. Uh, it's not open to the public, although we have the public um, watching. So Christian and I will put questions to the panelists. And they're also welcome to put questions to each other when we get to the discussion period. We're going to kick off with Ben. Um, who's talking, going to talk about the situation on the ground, the humanitarian situation in Gaza. We're interested in the physical security and psychological conditions that Gazans confront. We are also concerned about UNRWA and its personnel and how they're dealing with a, such a phenomenally difficult situation. So Ben, uh, with that, I hand over to you. Thank you very much for joining us in an incredibly hectic schedule, no doubt. Thanks very much, Laurie. Um, thank you so much for the for the invitation. I'm uh, very pleased to be here again. I'm very pleased to to join the wonderful members of the panel. Um, so speaking, you know, without notes, but uh, under your guidance of the the subjects you wanted me to speak to, I'll kind of uh, group my my comments roughly into, into three: so Gaza uh, as as we see it, um, um, the people in Gaza, and then and then UNRWA. Um, so I, I've been in Gaza a couple of times myself since the war started, most recently about three or four weeks ago. Um, you cross into Gaza um, through the Rafah checkpoint, uh, now famous, infamous, 
um, uh, from from Egypt, and it's it's quite extraordinary. You you cross in the space of twenty meters into what feels like a different world. It it, it and it is a different world in every sense. It, you you immediately confronted by a location, a kind of a warehouse type structure that was destroyed um, by a missile at the very beginning of the war, and um, once in Rafa and also from the Egyptian side, you can hear near constant explosions. Um, ground combat is now is now in the vicinity of just about everybody in Gaza, including in the south of Rafa. When I was last there, we had to move from point A to point B, which was sort of a three kilometer distance, but you had to go via Z because in between A and B in that tiny little space, there was ground combat and we had to move around it. Um, there are plumes of smoke from missiles that you can't necessarily hear, but you can see the plumes of smoke not far away. It's, um, it's remarkable to, in the space of 20 meters, go into a completely different world. Um, you are met by um, UNRWA trucks, and WFP, World Food Program trucks, and various other vehicles at the logistics uh, hub. Um, the rapid crossing point is also where the Kerem Shalom, also now famous, crossing point or the trucks meet you um you can go about 200 meters towards Karim Shalom and then it's a no man's land you're forbidden to enter um of about three kilometers leads to Karim Shalom crossing so you cross into Gaza and you've got trucks you've got people you've got um world uh, world kitchen which is this amazing NGO that makes meals for millions of people every day um if you want to move anywhere in in Rafa it takes a very long time because there are so many people so many tents tents being put up everywhere on the road you can't drive anywhere so typically uh, UNRWA will as soon as you go into Gaza you turn left and you follow the Egyptian border and when I say follow I mean you're 10 meters away from it um, to the left until the sea for about 20 minutes and you, when you reach the sea you turn right and follow a coastal road everywhere you go there are tents um, of various forms some are real tents some are tents made of plastic sheeting, some tents made of carpets that presumably do not keep the water out. All along the border, there are people digging in the ground, which at first we try to understand what they're digging for. They're digging for roots, which can then be used to burn, to uh, heat water or to be sold in the, um, um, in the marketplace. Um, so crowds of people absolutely everywhere. If you go to an under shelter, as, as I did, um, our ship, we have uh, uh, um, around 120 or so uh, shelters now. We had at one point 150 shelters uh, are constructed from our schools or our other premises, logistics spaces. We just converted them into places for people to live. Um, one school we visited in the middle of, uh, of Gaza a few weeks ago um, had about 17,000 people in the school and about another 40,000 living attached to the school, immediately around it and using the school facilities. So uh, around you know uh, fifty thousand people using the fourteen or fifteen toilets, um, a, a smaller number of showers. I forget how number. I forget the number. The school is on the one hand it's amazing. People have a place with walls that they can shelter in. On the other hand, it's appalling. It's completely filthy. Everything is filthy. The walls, the stairs, the floor, the the people are dirty because water is very very scarce you have to queue up for a very long time for water if you want to use the toilet you have to bring your own water and the water is very very dirty and if you, if you have if you have water to wash you need to heat it because it's very cold and heating is is a luxury you save for food so everything is dirty and if you're sick you're not going to get well and once things are wet they they stay wet and that's the luxury of having a school as opposed to the tents outside um in when you pause for a moment somebody will come up to you and say please can you put me on this list i want to be on this list because this list maybe gives me access to something um and with uh, with uh beneficiaries people living in the schools or, or other shelters or with our own staff the first questions when they have a moment is well how long can we stay here when will we, when when will the fighting reach here um when we're told to go by the idf should we wait should we leave immediately or should we wait for UNRWA to tell us to go? When we leave, where should we go next and how much can we take with us? And if the question is being asked in, in Rafa, the question is, well, where do we go? Because we can't go any further south. Are we going to go back north? And if so, how? And 
if I'm not able to bring, you know, the three bags with me that I brought here, because people, when they go through checkpoints, they can even take a small backpack with them. I won't be able to take my tent. Who will give me a tent? Will there be food? Um, the, the the atmosphere in, into my my second point on on people is um when i first went to gaza it's around november from the, the start of the war there was a sense of panic bizarrely in my last visit the panic had been removed and replaced to some extent by what seemed like a sense of resignation but was also a sense of of being organized people have moved five times so the sixth time the seventh time they're ready for it they have less, they're more desperate, they don't have much to go with, but they're organized. They know that if they're told to move, they have to move um, because that's the only way of maybe maybe staying alive. On the other hand, there was also a sense from some people, a, sense, a mixture of thank you, Unra, for being here, but also, Unra, what are you doing? You know, how is it possible you cannot be doing your job correctly? Because if you were doing your job correctly, people would not be bombing our schools and bombing your own shelters. Uh, shelters I visited four weeks ago have since been destroyed. People have been killed in those shelters. Um, and th so the question was, well, why isn't there enough food? Why isn't there enough water? Why is this bombing still happening? Everybody knows exactly what is happening. So what are you doing? You say you've been to the Security Council. You're saying you've been to the General Assembly. Obviously, you haven't told them the truth because if you had, this wouldn't be happening um, the way it is. So a huge amount of anger, frustration, um, a sense of abandonment by the entire world. Um, you know, what is the rest of the world doing? What is the region doing? What is the Security Council doing? If they've seen all this and they're still allowing it, then surely that means that nobody that nobody cares. If they've seen 11,000, 12,000 children being killed and it's not stopping, you know, obviously they don't care. There's no other explanation. Um, the international political aspects of this are, I think, irrelevant um, to people living living through this. Um, so a sense of organization, but also a sense of despair, a sense of anger, a tremendous, tremendous sense of fear among parents more than children. Children with their resilience are playing in the streets, even as you can hear ground combat and you can see the plumes of smoke from missiles. Children are still playing, but their parents are terrified because they've got nowhere to take their children. They don't know what more to say to them about their their friends being killed, about their schools not existing anymore or not being schools anymore. Um, they don't know when this will end or how it will end. Our staff, my, my third point, are um, amazing, I would say. They are incredible. Uh, moves me to tears, even as I uh, speak about them their resilience um i have a little video that i've shared with with a few colleagues um when we were last there of one colleague who i was with there with uh, the commissioner general of Unra, philippe nazarini and he made a speech and then uh, a colleague miranda her name is who is in charge of that particular location where we were she took the floor and she made this amazing speech about said you know we are under our staff we are un staff people are angry with us it doesn't matter we will absorb their anger because we are here for them, we are here for the UN, we are here for Palestinians, we are here for human rights. We will not leave, we will not abandon them. We will leave no one behind, I'm quoting her pretty much. An incredible speech, and it really typifies everybody there. Um, they're doing amazing work. They're the only thing really that gives a sense of structure to UNRWA. There are no more structures. There are amazing individuals, Palestinian Red Cross, incredible people, my colleagues from OCHA and the World, the World Health Organization doing amazing work. Uh, um, they didn't have the infrastructure that we had, and and so as amazing as their work is, uh, and I and I really sing their praises. UNRWA is the only structure that I think Palestinians in Gaza can hold on to that they have some faith in that hasn't abandoned them, as it were. Um, UNRWA is delivering um, everything from negotiating, or, uh, deconflicting the arrival of trucks and food to moving food off trucks onto other trucks and getting those trucks to where they need to go, offloading them again, again, deconflicting with the Israeli authorities, uh, with the de facto authorities, everything from that, you know, the macro things that we know about to the more micro, but no less important, helping the Bank of Palestine move cash from banks in the north of Gaza um, down to ATMs in the south of Gaza, finding fuel for generators to make the ATMs function so that 
people can withdraw cash so that the economy can keep functioning, which is absolutely vital to ensuring that the humanitarian uh, um, assistance is viable because without the economy, it's only the humanitarian actors providing things. So I'm doing everything between moving cash and fueling ATM machines to, to, to the bigger picture of trucks and everything in between providing Wi-Fi for the humanitarian organizations that meet in the morning, um, every morning on the premises, receiving detainees that are saving detainees that are released every few days at Kadem Shalom and arrive in a in a pretty difficult, um, pretty poor condition and providing them with, uh, but we have beds set up for every detainee that arrives so that they have somewhere to lie down and get some food. We try to contact their family members. So Andrea is somehow providing a semblance of, of the Mountie. Our staff are amazingly resilient. They're also very worried about themselves, about that, about their children. Um, and now I shift a little bit to the allegations and, and then I'll pass the floor back, Larry. Um, we were, I think as an organization, we were exhausted uh, as of mid-January from doing uh, um, close to 3,000 media interviews from all the operations on the ground in Gaza, the media interviews to try to get everybody talking about IHL and humanitarian assistance, many hundreds of meetings with uh, the US, with Israeli authorities to try to ensure that, to try to get Karim Shalom open. Uh, all the many of the things that we see now are, are thanks to uh, under colleagues working in collaboration with uh, the US and others. Um, so we were, I think, on the edge of, of exhaustion, but we were buoyed up by the, uh, the sense that we were, uh, you know, keeping Gaza on its feet and uh, by significant praise from around the world. Then these allegations hit um, and the donors swiftly, uh, many donors swiftly redue their funds. Um, and that has, you know, created a whole other level of, of, of challenge, um, trying to explain to donors what we understand about the situation, which is uh, limited understanding. We don't have that many much in terms of the facts. Um, we have been very encouraged by the amazing support of donors that have not withdrawn, um, Norway included, uh, also Ireland, uh, Spain, Portugal. And th that lack, that decision not to withdraw has actually been an enormous uh, sort of send a source of hope, but also political support. Um, the allegations that we've been told of were allegations against 12 individuals. Um, we don't know if uh, the 12 are, uh, are guilty, if one is guilty and the others are innocent. We'll find out in, in due course, we hope. Um, what And these will be my, my, my concluding comments. What we is clear for us, and I think clear for our member states, but not yet clearly reflected in action is that even if true, there may be uh, true allegations against 12 or against one or against two or against 20, maybe there are allegations we don't know about. There are allegations against individuals um, uh, amongst our 30,000 staff in a highly, highly complex context um, where for many people in this region, the militant Palestinian organizations are the resistance. And even if the resistance has done things that are criminal and you know and deeply wrong, for many people in the region, there's still the resistance against an occupation. Um, it's very difficult to have that the conversation uh, with 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 Palestinians, which is very much intertwined with their national aspirations. So on the one hand, we have allegations against indi against individuals. On the other hand, um, what is also clear to us is that UNRWA is an organization, an organization which has been um, you know, universally acclaimed for many years, including last year, including at the beginning of this year, as being the, the principal multilateral contribution to stability in the Middle East, stability and peace for Palestinians and for Israelis and for the wider region, widely recognized by Israeli civilian uh, um, political actors, Israeli military actors, in years when we haven't, including last year, where we didn't have enough money to pay salaries, a lot of concern amongst our, uh, our counterparts um, in Israel, that an inability to pay salaries will equate to um, instability in, in the occupied Palestinian, ter Palestinian territories and therefore risks to risks to um, to uh, to Israel's security. So on the one hand, we have a story stories about allegations about individuals. On the other hand, we have an organization that is a, a pillar of stability for the whole region including and importantly you know we are UN officials we we work we have a I have a, a mandate to support Palestinians but I also have a UN mandate which is to support uh, human rights and uh, peace and security development for all including Israelis including Jordanians where I'm currently speaking from now so we're always interested in which is very much Antonio Guterres's uh, position he's interested in the the best interest of all states and all and all peoples 
Um, and so we've been sharing this message with member states and saying, look, what we have on the table now is not just the, the catastrophic situation in Gaza, which can still get worse, but we also have a, a, uh, a fragility being included, being added to the overall regional situation in the Middle East. For, uh, the West Bank is extremely fragile. And um, UNRWA has long been a, 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 has had importance way beyond its size because of our symbolism, because of links between our mandate and the political solution. UNRWA has importance way beyond our services to Palestinians and our 700 schools because of our, our peace in regional stability. And we are desperately worried that that uh, peace of regional stability is now being uh, rendered fragile. It's been really weakened without any uh, real reflection on the consequences. And so this was the subject of a letter that um, Commission General sent to the General Assembly a few days ago, for those who haven't seen it, worth looking up, which basically says, um, member states, you ha we have to think urgently about peace and security in the Middle East, about human rights in the Middle East for all populations. Palestinians and Israelis alike, and what is happening to UNRWA now is is making that situation even worse. And we desperately hope that you will you will uh, seize be seized of this situation, including the UNRWA part of it, and you, you will uh, steer UNRWA to to a safer place so that we can uh, perform uh, uh, implement our mandate to the best of our abilities, including for the stability and recovery of Gaza. Laurie, back to you. Ben, thank you. You, thank you. You, paint, you paint a picture of life in Gaza that is just heartbreaking and phenomenal that people have some measure of resilience in a situation of such acute fear and uncertainty. Um, it's also your full respect for UNRWA staff, for your personnel, for their courage, their commitment, um, their perseverance in really dangerous and stressful situation. You, you ended by talking about the controversy surrounding UNRWA and distinguished between allegations against a small number of people, members of the organization and the organization itself, which is, has done and continues to do such incredible work. And that's really the point at which we, we segue to Lenny, who has been invited to talk to us about the politics of humanitarian aid. And that applies in particular to this crisis, but not only to this crisis. We would like to imagine in an ideal world that humanitarian aid was apolitical uh, and the politics didn't get in the way of raising the funds and delivering the aid. But of course, life is much more complicated than that. So Lenny, with that, um, I hand over to you. Lenny, you're muted still. Thank you for inviting me to this seminar. Uh, good afternoon, good evening, everyone. Um, I, I, it's really um, incredible to hear Ben uh, share his uh, his um, his stories from Gaza. Um, I was the Deputy Commissioner General for UNRWA for three years until September last year. I also spent a uh, considerable amount of time in in Gaza, but not since uh, since October. Uh, so it's really heartbreaking to hear uh, Ben describing now the disastrous situation on the ground in Gaza. I have to underline that today uh, I speak in my private capacity. I do not speak as a Norwegian diplomat, nor do I speak on behalf of UNRWA. So I will only express my own views. And as we heard from from Ben uh, about the humanitarian situation on the ground in Gaza. Uh, it's clear that we're witnessing today one of the most appalling example of uh, politicization of humanitarian assistance, as well as the most uh, blatant disregard of humanitarian principles and humanitarian law that the world has seen in decades. And let it be clear, uh, neither Hamas nor IDF respect the rules of AIHL in, in Gaza. And Ben described the situation on the ground in Gaza, and we have to remember that while children are about to starve to death in northern Gaza, well-off Israelis are playing tennis at the beach in Tel Aviv, just a few miles away. And while trucks of life-saving humanitarian assistance is waiting to cross one of the two border crossings, crossings, Kerem Shalom or Rafa, desperate people are fighting for survival behind the border walls, and they're raiding the few trucks that can reach northern Gaza. People who are seeking protection at deconflicted UNRWA shelters experience frequent attacks by IDF 
and almost 400 civilians have been killed while seeking protection at UNRWA schools and clinics in Gaza. And as we all know, on the 26th of January 2024, the International Court of Justice issued a legally binding provisional ruling that, regarding Palestinians in Gaza. And it said that Israel must take all measures within its power to prevent the commission of all acts within the scope of Article 2 of the Convention of the Prevention and Punishment of the Crime of Genocide, as well as immediate and effective measures to enable the provision of urgently needed basic services and humanitarian assistance to address the adverse conditions of life faced by Palestinians in the Gaza Strip. I think it's important to quote word by word uh, the provisional ruling by ICJ. And bearing that in mind, we heard the Commissioner General today speak to uh, CNN, uh, where he shared with the world that since that ruling, the amount of aid that has entered into Gaza has fallen by 50%. That is 50% less in February than in January. WFP is sounding the alarm that hunger is imminent. And some argue uh, that Israel is blocking aid to force Hamas to accept a temporary ceasefire and, and to release hostages. And meanwhile, IDF relentless bombing of civilians in Gaza continues. We heard today that 25% of those killed, uh, uh, no, 25,000 of the 30,000 killed in Gaza, according to Pentagon, are women and children. The Israeli attacks on UNRWA has to be seen through this lens. As stated in the letter from the Commissioner General to the uh, UN General Assembly, that we just heard men, Ben refer to, um, Israel has called for the dismantling of the agency and has asked Philip Lazzarini, the Commissioner General, to step down. Israel argues that UNRWA is infiltrated by Hamas and that its operation is not carried out in respect of the humanitarian principle of neutrality. Israel knows very well that only UNRWA can deliver humanitarian assistance at scale in the Gaza Strip today. Israel knows very well that only UNRWA has the humanitarian muscle that will be required to save the hundreds of thousands of lives that are at risk as we speak. The call from Israel in it itself, a clear breach of the responsibility they hold to facilitate humanitarian access and ensure that humanitarian assistance can reach the civilian population in Gaza. Israel's actions and statements harms UNRWA's operation as the agency, like any UN agency, cannot operate without the support of host states. But make no mistake, the call from Israel to dismantle UNRWA is not only a breach of their obligations under IHL during the active conflict in Gaza. It is a political one. Calls today by the government of Israel for UNRWA's closure are not about a, the agency's neutrality. It is an attempt from Israel to eliminate UNRWA's role in protecting the right of the Palestine refugees and to prevent UNRWA from providing millions of Palestine refugees uh, with access to human development through education and basic health programs, as well as humanitarian support. And despite this rather obvious fact, for anyone who has been following developments in the Middle East for a few years, a surprisingly high number of donor countries have announced a pause or a suspension of their contributions to UNRWA. 16 donor countries are on the list of member states that are willing to be swayed by Israel in their attempt to fulfill a long-time goal of dismantling the agency, and this amid a catastrophic humanitarian crisis in Gaza. And by doing so, donor countries are putting not only civilians in Gaza at further risk, but also Palestinian refugees who depend on the services from UNRWA in Lebanon, the West Bank, Syria, and Jordan. And according to the latest update from UNRWA, the organization may not be able to continue to deliver uh, their uh, services in a few months from now, should donor countries not provide sufficient funding. And I was asked to comment on how UNRWA and donors should approach this situation. And first, on UNRWA. UNRWA should continue its efforts to showcase how it has worked systematically to ensure neutrality. For years, UNRWA has been constantly under attack from pro-Israeli groups, who in their attempt to ad advance Israel's goal of closing down the agency, has tried to put forward evidence that the organization is flawed and biased. UNRWA has been, and should continue to be, 
very clear on the following message. While the organization has a zero tolerance towards any acts within its ranks that compromises the organization's neutrality, there will never be a zero risk. This is not exclusive to UNRWA's operations. The same goes for all humanitarian organizations operating in humanitarian crisis. But for the agency, as we heard from Ben, uh, that is mandated to deliver services to and by Palestinian refugees who has been denied their rights to return, granted to them by the international community, and among whom many live in their occupations or blockade, this should come as no surprise to anyone. Surely more could have been done and more can be done. And to this end, a cash trap agency has for years requested additional funding to further strengthen its oversight mechanisms. So what should the donors do now? Donors should, as a first step, release their planned funding to UNRWA. This will not only be crucial in the financial sense, but also send a strong political signal that they're not willing to be played by Israel. They should not wait for the upcoming independent review of UNRWA com UNRWA's compliance with this neutrality framework expected to arrive in a few weeks. But even if most donors return, I fear that their contributions will not be sufficient, sufficient to safeguard the agency, even in the short term. One of the key donors have indicated that they do not foresee that they will return as donors to the agency, at least not in Gaza, regardless of the outcome of the independent review. Their risk is high that the agency will face a financial collapse before year's end. But there is more at stake than the funding to the agency for the remaining of this year. Donors know very well that UNRWA was under severe pressure also before 7th of October. The voluntary funding model established in 1949 is no longer sustainable. The Commissioner General had repeatedly called for a political discussion on the future of the agency long before 7th of October. Donors should ask themselves how they intend to deliver on the rights of Palestine refugees until there is a political solution to the occupation. Israel has been clear that UNRWA should play no role in Gaza in the future, while other agencies and NGOs surely can deliver food and emergency assistance to the millions of the refugees in the Strip. No agency can substitute UNRWA's education system. No other agency can fill the void that the agency will leave behind, neither in Gaza nor in the other fields of its operation. Donors should understand the risks involved by not securing the agency in a situation where there is no alternative. Donors should ensure that the role, UNRWA, that the role of UNRWA is an integral part of any discussion on the post-war arrangement in Gaza. Donors should ensure that the dysfunctional funding model of the agency is scrapped and replaced by a predictable and sustainable funding model. Donors should invest in the modernization of UNRWA, including in strengthening its oversight mechanism. Uh, and to end, I will uh, draw your attention to the Commissioner General's letter to the GA. He summarizes the fundamental question in his letter to the General Assembly. Will the parameters of peace for both Palestinians and Israelis be wiped away by obstructing UNRWA's mandate and defending the agency outside of any political agreement and consultations with the Palestinians? Or will this be a moment where the member states provide the political support necessary to sustain UNRWA and the premise of Resolution 302, and through this continue to invest in the prospects of peace in the Middle East? We don't know, but it's time for member states, among them also the donors, to choose to be on the right side of history. Thank you. Many, thank you for a very powerful, clear, passionate, uh, support endorsement of defense of UNRWA. Um, I would love to find a way through at least the, the CRUC and the PREA websites to amplify your, your different calls um, on what donors should be doing. It's also important, so thank you for, for highlighting the ICJ ruling with respect to Israel's responsibilities in terms of the crime of genocide. I hand over to Allah. Um, and his brief is to talk about the question of security and governance in Gaza when the heavy fighting ends. There's been discussion in the media around the term or the phrase the day after. And the day after has both a long term uh, time frame, which is negotiations for some kind of resolution, final resolution of the conflict. But it also has a short to medium term time frame. 
when the heavy fighting ends, who governs Gaza and how is Gaza to be governed? There are proposals that have been made in this regard by Prime Minister Netanyahu and by President Biden. And we're inviting Allah to comment on those proposals, but also to give your own view on what you think is most desirable among a set of really unattractive, undesirable options. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and uh, thank you, Ben and Lainey, for your uh, moving and um, and powerful interventions. Um, as as Laurie mentioned, I'm asked to bring the politics to the story in a way. And uh, but before I get I get to the politics, Ben, earlier today I was as uh, I received two messages from colleagues from Gaza, two of my colleagues from Gaza, when they knew that. Uh, we will be on the same call, and they asked me to send you two messages. The first one is to tell you that you as UNRWA are also victims of the international world order, victim of the failure of the international system. They are not the only victims there, but you as UNRWA, as an institution that belongs to the international order, are also victims of, of that international failure. And the second message from another, from another colleague, from Amani there, she said 70 years of filling gaps and addressing humanitarian crisis and tackling humanitarian issues is a long period and it's enough. It's time to move to tackle and address the political roots of these humanitarian issues. I know they are not breaking news to you per se, but it's really important uh, to, um, uh, to keep these fundamental issues in, in mind. Shifting gears going to the politics uh, and um, the day after um, many Western governments and policy circles and international institutions are totally obsessed with this idea of the day after. And maybe if I start with, uh, with a wish, I, I wish if they are really obsessed uh, with the day before, in the sense, addressing the root causes of what got us to this point, because understanding the day before and understanding what led us to, to the tragic moment of, of today is more important uh, and more difficult rather than addressing the day after how Gaza will be governed and who will govern Gaza and by whom and all of that. But if it is difficult to go and tackle the question about the day before, maybe we address the present day. We address today five months on, and we're still failing to reach a meaningful ceasefire agreement. We're able to, we're unable to stop the war, five months and more and counting. So if, if it is very difficult to address the day before or the present day, is it easier to address the day after with all the challenges? So, but maybe uh, global politics and power games don't have enough space for wishes. And enough. So let me um, go and tackle three different issues uh, in my intervention. One about the different contested visions of security and governance for Gaza. Secondly, focus uh, on, on Israeli and American plans and visions and proposals, but also on the different re Palestinian reactions to these, um, to these visions. And thirdly, what are some of the prerequisites or needed conditions for any future option? And as you mentioned earlier, I'm afraid that all of them are bad options, uh, at least in the, short, in the short term. Starting with the contested, contested vision, different visions. Let me maybe start with the vision that we don't hear enough about, uh, maybe because it doesn't exist. And ironically enough, it is the Palestinian vision for the day after uh, in Gaza. And that's also show us a major problem. After five months of this, Palestinian factions are failing to meet and decide on the vision forward. As we speak at the moment, they are in Moscow trying to reach some kind of an arrangement or an agreement or some broad lines for the day after. It took very long time. 30,000 people being killed until these Palestinian factions come together. And we know very well the keys for Palestinian unity are not in Moscow. They have them in their pockets if the political will is there. But what is important is that if we really think about the day after is to center the Palestinian vision as well, and not only to focus on the Israeli one and the American one because they have the stronger power. 
yes, the Palestinians meeting now, uh, they have a long list of things to do. I agree on uh, achieve Palestinian unity or sorts of it, but also revive institutions that bring them together, including the, the PLO, the Palestinian Liberation Organization, and make it more inclusive. And you make it more inclusive by having Hamas in particular and Islamic Jihad on board, having it as part of it. And as well as start discussing the design and implementation of post-war reconstruction. At the moment, we only hear Israeli vision, American vision, Arab visions for the post-war reconstructions of this Palestinian lives. But what about the Palestinian vision for that? So, but regardless of, uh, of all of this, um, this vision uh, would be contested by the different visions, by the Israeli one, by the American one, by European one, by, Arab, some, by some of Arab countries, because precisely because of the inclusion of Hamas in the day after. Lots of obsession at the moment is about how we bypass Hamas, how we go the day after without having Hamas on board. Unfortunately, for the, the news for these uh, different actors, is that they need to find a way to reconcile with the fact that Hamas will be and has to be included in the day after, in the arrangement, the day after, in any kind of process. We cannot be politically naive to think that Hamas will just disappear as Israeli vision will, uh, would like to do, would like to think uh, would be the case. So the important element is to find, for these actors to find a way to reconcile that Hamas will be part of any future arrangement. Because the equation is really simple, which is the exclusion formula uh, that led to where we are at the moment. Let's imagine if the international community respected the results of the Palestinian democratic elections in 2006, we will be in a very different position. And I hope that we as an international community are learning from it, learning from these mistakes the hard way when we when we see the results of what do what happens when major actors are are excluded so and but so there are these two contrasting visions but there is a third category let's say of, of visions coming from different european circles and some uh, arab countries um uh, and that aim for different kind of formula so if we think about some of the european circles like in france France cares about today and maybe half about, about the day after. Uh, Egypt and Qatar are interested in today, but Saudi Arabia and Emirates are interested in the day after. Why I'm mentioning all of this? I'm mentioning all of this because we have so many different visions for, for the day after. And the question, who would reconcile these different visions? They are very contested visions. Ideally, it is the UN, or global governance institutions. But what happens if they cannot, if they, not, if they are not allowed to do their job? That's where, is where we have the main issue. For me, it is the duty of these international global governance institutions to come and deal with this matter, to reconcile these different visions. This is why fixing security and governance issues in Gaza requires first and foremost to fix the system of global governance and global international, international global institutions. So really take that uh, dramatic and uh, 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 difficult moment to create an opportunity uh, to, to think about how we can reinvent the global governance institutions. You might come and tell me, well, another wishful thinking. Well, maybe, yes, maybe it's another wishful thinking, but does it matter? I argue, yes, it matters. It matters if we are serious about what we preach about when it comes to accountability, rule-based orders, and all of that stuff. If, we, if we're really serious about all these principles that we, uh, we uh, claim to uh, uphold ourselves to, then yes, it is serious that solving the issue in Gaza, solving the issue in Palestine, Israel, requires first to solve the larger issue at the global level where we see the UNRWA is part of, uh, of the victims of all of, of all of that. So going to um, the second point on um, American and Israeli's plans and visions for Gaza, I think it is quite um, evident 
and it is clear that whatever vision both parties come up with Gaza, they will not be in the interest of the Palestinian people. If that's breaking news to anyone, then there will be a fundamental problem. A colonial power does not come, uh, does not care about the welfare of the colonized. That is very, very straightforward. What both visions agree on, the American and Israeli one, is to secure Israel again, the Israeli security first paradigm, to normalize the relations with other with other countries in, in the region, to, to create a sustainability of a status quo or uh, regional stability as it was seen, equivalent to uh, regional peace, to criminalize Palestinian resistance and uh, resistance to the Israeli settler colonial project, and fundamentally here, to design a Palestinian leadership that fits these parameters, to design a Palestinian leadership that is able to deliver this American and Israeli vision in the day after. What over the past 30 years came to be known as the Partners for Peace. Partners for Peace as defined by Israel and as defined by the US. And that's a big question where both parties agreed that a Palestinian leadership uh, 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 an entity that govern in the day after needs to be kept for for this purpose and to be uh, to be for that in order to get rid of Hamas and in order to engage uh, in uh, in processes that dismantle the infrastructure for armed resistance and install that that leadership in in place and here from a Palestinian side there are different ways to react to that. One, as Hamas is, is doing and trying to do, is to push back in multiple ways. One, as the Palestinian Authority is trying to do, is to entertain the idea. Maybe they become relevant in a way or another. But there are other actors uh, that would like to capitalize on this tragic moment to create another political opportunity to reinvent the Palestinian political system and the structures of governance. And that is another entry point uh, uh, that should be capitalized on to bring some hope uh, amidst all of the pain that we're we're going through. Finally, there are many uh, the options. There are many options, many scenarios. Uh, uh, clearly, in the short term, uh, none of them is is good per se. In the sense that, uh, for what purpose to construct, where to construct, and we're not even talking about post war reconstruction. We're talking still how to stop stop this war. Um, and there are multiple ways and multiple um, uh, uh, options out there. But regardless of all of that, regardless of what kind of options we have there, and we can discuss these in, in the discussion as, we, uh, as I'm running out of time, but I would like to put a couple of uh, prerequisites, if you like, or a couple of uh, issues that we should not dismiss, whatever option uh, we come up with. We should stick to five hows, in my opinion. How not to normalize death? It's after all these months, a uh, hundred just being killed in the streets while, we're, while they are waiting for their, uh, for their food assistance. How do we make sure that we don't normalize death and killing? How do we make sure that crimes won't become invisible as they keep piling? How do we make sure they are not invisible? But importantly, not to see the action again and again, how how to make sure uh, that we hold those who cause this catastrophic situation accountable? Accountability is sorely missed. And also, how do we address the political roots of this catastrophe? It's enough of talking about the catastrophe. We need to talk and tackle the political roots of all of that in order not to reduce the matter to a mere fun uh, humanitarian crisis. It is not a humanitarian crisis. It is political par, par excellence. And the crisis of the honor war here is a crisis of a failure at the global governance system that needs to be solved. To end this with the honor war, I also would like to see the end of the honor war, but I would like to see it for the right reasons. I would like to see it when the Palestinian refugees practice their right of return according to international law and to the UN resolutions. That's when I want to see the honor war ended and I don't want to see it because then I know that the root causes of the issue being addressed. I will stop here. Sorry if I took more time, but uh, we can uh, discuss more also during the conversation. Great. Thank you, Allah. Appreciate your comments. I appreciate your, your 
challenging my use of the term uh, the day after, and I think you're absolutely right, of course. If by the day before, we mean the political structural problem of illegal occupation, then of course, it's not the day before, it's today. And it's tomorrow for the foreseeable future until there is a satisfactorily negotiated resolution of the fundamental conflict. And as you say rightly, that raises the challenge of greater cohesion, if not unity, amongst the Palestinian factions and entities and political actors to the point at which they are able to present a unified front, whatever the differences between them, without which it's very hard to see how we can recognize Palestinian leadership on the future of Palestine. So thank you for those comments. I want to invite um, Christian, but also the, the panelists to comment on what other panelists have said. And you're also welcome to ask questions, to put questions, um, because this is a university-based webinar. You're welcome to disagree with each other. Uh, and if you do want to speak, just we're not going to use the little emojis. Just raise your hand, and I'll bring you into the conversation. So I invite you to put questions to each other or to respond to uh, what other panelists have said. If I if I may go first, I'd really like to hear from um, from all all the three panelists what they think about each other's interventions. But just uh, on the basis of um, of Allah's very thoughtful intervention, I want to ask Allah and Ben and Lenny, for that matter, uh, you laid out a um, the positions of a series of international actors, all of uh, vile, seemingly fairly helpless, in the sense of being unable to uh, really move the needle on on in the current situation, are still the most influential actors. Now, if you sort of disregard the question of who the actors are that actually have the power to move anything, and just think about this as a market of uh, ideas for what uh, future governance in Gaza and in the Palestinian territories could look like. What are, what are the most promising thoughts that you have been able to detect in the larger debate, which I know that you are following extremely closely? Christian, thank you. I, let's go in the same order in which our panelists spoke initially. Um, so we'll do a round, um, Ben, then Lenny, then Allah, um, responding to Christian's point. And as, as before, you're free to say whatever you want to in response to the other panelists. Ben? Thank you. Thank you. I, I, very, um, very honored to have, to have uh, again, to be, to be sharing the panel with, with, um, with the other speakers, with Allah and with Lenny. Thank you so much. And Christian, thanks. Thanks for your question. Um, I'll sort of pick up a little bit on, on on Lenny's points to begin with, and then respond to Christian's question. So, I mean, if we, Anya has been been you know been caught up in these allegations about individuals, but as I said, let's you know, we have to step back from this and look. You know, what is it that we that we are seeing? And we are seeing um, the the fragile, very very fragile, the tenuous. Parameters, uh, as we put it in our letter to the General Assembly, the parameters for peace in the Middle East being being shaken. Um, Allah, in quoting uh, a friend of his in Gaza, um, the second person said, "You know, 70, 70 years is enough," and he or she is absolutely right. And we also try to pick up with that a little bit in our General Assembly letter by saying, "Look, either support UNRWA or, or transition directly to a political solution, which is really where we where we need to be." So on the one hand, the fragile parameters of peace are being shaken to the core, including the UNRWA part of it. And on the other hand, we also know that um, that, that peace often comes from moments of crisis. It's difficult, very difficult and painful to talk about this as an opportunity. Um, we have to somehow hope there is an opportunity in there. We have to try to get something good out of this, this disaster. Um, and history tells us that uh, big things come out of these sorts of moments. So I think my and transitioning to Christian's question, um, my sort of big two thoughts after listening to the others are number one, what is let's not lose um the big picture. What is happening here? We are 
sh shaking this incredibly important region because it's a crossroads of so much uh, geography and politics. It's being shaken and we don't know to what purpose. We don't have a, we don't, it's not a, a coordinated shaking. It's not part of a conversation, a political conversation between states. It's just being shaken. That is a disastrous thing to do uh, for anywhere, most especially for this region. So we have to focus member states' attention on the region, on what is happening to it. We have to stabilize it. We have to provide a direction of travel. It needs to be part of a political process that has to happen very, very urgently before um, circumstances are irreversible. And on the more positive uh, question that Christina answered, I think um, I'm going to give a, a, a somewhat facile answer. One of the, the, the negatives of this region is that um, peace has been tried so much. I, I recently um, went through various sources to try to compile a list of every single peace process for this region in the last 75 years. And I uncovered processes I, ne I never heard of. I don't know if anybody in the room has heard of the Rogers peace process, but there was a Rogers peace process at one point, uh, a Secretary of State of the United States, uh, Rogers. Um, so that's a, a negative is that pieces we've failed so many times. On the positive, um, if you put all of those failures together, and as I did, there's a lot of commonalities between them and it gives you a very clear direction of travel of what will work. Almost everything has been tried uh, and it's quite clear why things didn't work. We also have an abundance of international law and abundance of resolutions providing parameters. Um, so I, I think my my rather facile answer is um, let's go through everything that has failed uh, and, and we work out almost a Venn diagram like what is left uh, what is clear that that can work why did they fail so let's bring the parameters of international law the the political uh statements of member states in uh, security council resolutions and german assembly resolutions the council ones are legally binding the german assembly ones are morally binding to some extent and um the the the, the beauty also of the situation other situations to some extent are more complex this is complex because of the political positions of different axes but the the principal position is actually is actually very clear. So I think, and I think the very, very large majority of member states, massive majority, almost every single member state are actually on board with, with, with those parameters. So in that sense, it's also relatively easy. So I, I would say bring all of the member states to, to the table, set out the parameters of what hasn't worked and what we know uh, is necessary to go forward, uh, uh, surrounded by international law, and let's start taking taking decisions on that basis. Thanks. Ben, thank you. I just want to amplify one of your points here before I hand over to Lenny, which is to say, from both a research and practitioner perspective, your point about learning from history around a given uh, conflict is really important. It's an issue that the Kroc Institute and Priya have been talking about in relation to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And that learning lessons from the past has both a substantive focus, so that's content, what would what would a negotiated settlement look like, but also, and this is our particular interest, what's the process lesson that we can learn? There have been many mediation, mediated negotiations from the US, from the region, et cetera, and mistakes were made, and there's no reason to repeat those mistakes in the future. This is not to say that we are brimming with optimism, but it is to say that we haven't lost hope there is the possibility of negotiations at some point in the future, and we really ought to learn what has been preferable and what has not been preferable from these previous experiences. So thank you for that comment. Um, Lenny, uh, you have the floor. Thank you so much. Uh, and thank you for the uh, excellent interventions from the other panelists. Very interesting. Um, I wanted to uh, use uh, this opportunity when I have the floor to, to ask a question. Um, we heard, uh, you know, about the um, uh, the ongoing uh, attempts to to define what comes after, uh, and we have, a, you know, the medium term, the long term, and the short term. And we know that uh, Norway and Egypt has announced that they are planning to host a humanitarian conference. Uh, the timing hasn't been set, and I was interested in hearing from the panelists, from Ben you know, uh, being the chief of staff in UNRWA and from you then being, you know, someone following the political discussions, 
Um, what should uh, we expect from such a conference? What, how should it be framed? Uh, what are the risks uh, of having such a conference? What will be the right timing? Um, because you know it could certainly be uh, an isolated uh, fundraising conference to make sure that there is more trucks going into Gaza after a ceasefire, but it could also be way more. And it could also, of course, address potentially, maybe in the margins, some of the underlying uh, questions related to the future of the whole Middle East. So my question to you, uh, and not as a Norwegian diplomat, I have to stress, is uh, what uh, should the focus be of such a conference and what could be the outcome? Thanks. Thank you, Lenny. And I'm going to give you first bite on that uh, and then hand back to Ben. You're also welcome to respond to Christian's question and any other things that you wish to raise. Thank you. Um, yeah, I mean, a number of uh, issues, uh, maybe going to uh, Ben's point about peace. Uh, I really think we really need to redefine peace. Uh, in our region, and especially when it comes to Palestine, Israel, and I'm not meaning I don't mean it here in an intellectual exercise, uh, because ask many people that they really don't like the word peace. The word peace became very dirty because it is associated with failures, and that novel idea that we all aspire to is not desired. Not because we don't like, not because people don't like peace, but because it became a function of security, of stability. It became a function of sustainability of the status quo. So it is really, which is uh, not good news to the oppressed people. So how do we engage in processes to redefine the word peace and reclaim its real meaning is really part of the exercise and, you know, and this is part of the exercise then in any conference when it is nicknamed as peace conference that's alarming already when if, the, if they talk about peace now because we're very very far from that if anything we need to talk about prerequisites for for peace but linking two points uh, also from Lenny and ben is about the political courage what does it take us to have the political courage at the global level to really start addressing the issues and addressing the problems instead of maneuvering around the problems? And what kind of con consequences that has on, on the uh, larger, uh, larger conflict? So this is what is lacking and what is needed now is um, political courage to engage in different processes, to reinvent the framework that been dominating the whole issue for the past decades, if the reset moment of 7th of October gave us any indicator, is to indicate that this whole framework is not working and we need to be creative. And we know we know the, how we can be creative, but it is if we have the political courage to go and say, we acknowledge failure, 30 years of more, this political framework didn't work, let's talk more about the root causes again. So that's uh, another um, another element to to add to to that. But fundamentally, I think now we are really at a crossroad. We are at a crossroad between those actors who really uh, uh, support the practice of violation of international norm, international law on a daily basis, and the other actors who really want to uphold that, and other actors who are fine with normalize, normalization of that, but other actors who know want to demand accountability. So we are at a gl global crossroad in, in, driven by what is happening in Gaza. And I don't think this is an exaggeration in, in many ways. Uh, so I think what, how do we move from this cr crossroad to bring accountability central to any kind of any future arrangement that is really fundamental. And going back to Lenny's question about any kind of Len's question about any kind of conference, yes, the risk is high to, to become a fundraising conference. This is what we've seen after any major war on Gaza over the past years. And you gather five and six billion, and then the reconstruction doesn't take place. Why? Because again, we're not addressing the political economy of that post-war reconstructions. We're not addressing the issues. So the risk is high to adopt economic solutions to the political crisis. Let's engage in another post-war 
reconstruction process. We know these billions of dollars can deliver. So maybe that, that's a way of where we engage in economic peace approaches. Uh, and all these are options because they allow us to maneuver around the problems uh, rather than engaging with them. But here where the Palestinian agency should come in very strong, and this is where I end with the, with the, with the question, Christian, is to what extent the Palestinian agency now after the October will be different than the previous one. If we, if we see the same Palestinian governance setup, then the Palestinians lost a major opportunity uh, that, uh, that is in front of their eyes now, as painful as it is. And if the Palestinian factions and Palestinian different kinds of leaderships don't make use, um, and that sounds very brutal, but yes, don't make use of this strategic political opportunity that is out there, then that is really last chance. Uh, I'm not having any high hopes from all the conversations that are happening in, in, in Moscow at the moment, but at least if these conversations engage in serious debate about Palestinian political system, about national program, about PLO institutions, about unified leadership, and really come up with concrete roadmap to the world about the vision of the day after in Gaza, I think, then the Palestinian agency being claimed. And that is really the promising sign uh, when it comes to any kind of arrangement as the day after. But unfortunately, you're right. Uh, the most powerful actors, US, Israel in this case, they are the holder of, um, and they want to dictate what will happen in the day after in collaboration uh, with others. But on the other hand, we shouldn't underestimate the power of ideas, the power of alternative narrative, the power of, uh, uh, of strategic thinking beyond the existing framework that we were made to think within uh, over the past decades. I, I want to respond briefly a lot to your um, skepticism about peace. And I say this as a peace studies scholar and peace practitioner who works in a peace Institute, and I have to say, I agree with you. The the whole uh, development of peace studies as an academic discipline in the mid late 1960s was premised on the idea of peace as peace with justice, meaning sustainable peace required addressing the underlying structural and political problems, and that anything short of that was simply putting a band aid over the problem, and it was not sustainable. So there is reason to be skeptical about calls for peace. Groups that are oppressed, the Palestinians, but this is a global problem, groups that are oppressed do not want peace for peace sake. They want peace with justice. And that is not only a normative and ethical consideration, it's a pragmatic one. Because without justice, at least sufficient justice, from the perspective of the conflict parties, you don't have sustainable peace. So there is support for your skepticism of peace, even from, or especially from the peace studies camp. Um, ben, in your hands. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, make four points. The last will be a, will be a question actually to to the others. Um, first, Laurie, you you mentioned that you know in terms of learning from the past, it was very important to look at process, and you have studied this much more than I. But my 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 limits of study, I absolutely agree with you. And I think um, it, from a kind of process point of view, Allah references sort of how much agency will the uh, the Palestinian part of the equation have going forward. And and um my sense is indeed that you know most of the substantive ideas of peace, um, whatever it means uh, for this situation going forward, have been elaborated uh, and we sort of have them in various forms over the years. Um, and what hasn't, what has most obviously not worked, has been process and the extent of agency and the mediators. And I think I think we we should be able to to shift that. A second point um, on Lenny's questions, um, I had heard that there was going to be a or will be a uh, humanitarian conference um, hosted um, very uh, wonderfully by Edith and and Norway. Um, I think our, our initial sense is that indeed, as, as the question implies, is that, um, and indeed as the subject of Lenny's focus uh, in this panel um, uh, makes explicit, um, the humanitarian part of this uh, of this situation is highly, highly political. Um, 
And I think a, a humanitarian conference needs very much to have a, a, a political component or a political perspective. And indeed, one of the outcomes of the conference, uh, um, is perhaps a bit ambitious, it could be that it could lead sort of directly into, into a political process that helps us to find a way through. Uh, and then not only to the humanitarian crisis, but also a beginning or even the middle of a, of, a, of a political solution. And I think that all of that needs to happen in short order. And um, with a humanitarian conference being led by one sort of host of Palestinians, Egypt, and by a, a long-standing or the, the most preeminent um, multilateral leader of uh, amongst member states of um, peace processes, Norway, um, that's a very good start. Um, my, my, and also a part, one of the risks we have to, not the risk, but one of the things we have to be careful of in the, with, with the conference is to make sure that in particular that it, it, it stands up for, for UNRWA and isn't sort of a vehicle, isn't abused as a vehicle uh, to sort of have a purely humanitarian effort, which is purely, uh, just uh, calculated in terms of dollars and, and boxes of food uh, delivered through others, but anything but UNRWA and therefore shifting UNRWA aside, including all of the under all that under represents from a political point of view. So I, I think one of the key um, goals of the conference should be, or one goal of the conference should be to to kind of keep UNRWA front and center because of of what we represent for Palestinians. My third point, very briefly, is um, it, sort of a, it's beyond really the scope of, of this panel, but we, as as we all know. Um, multilateralism has been sort of uh, um, talked about with a lot of tears shed um, in recent years, including in the last uh, 12 months, uh, Ukraine, and, and now in particular this situation, where is multilateralism, where are the multilateral institutions, the Security Council, um, difficult to, to find it when we need it. Um, however, one arguably bright spot in this is the General Assembly, and particularly on this situation, General Assembly is you know, very heavily unified, and um, we have increasingly been sort of slightly increasing the powers of the General Assembly. Um, next week, there will be a, I believe, a, a session of the General Assembly on Monday, at which the, the United States will go to the General Assembly to explain why it vetoed a resolution at the council, a new sort of uh, mechanism that's been set up. So th some accountability from the council to the general assembly. Um, so one one point I'm thinking uh, beyond the scope of this of this panel is more, you know, as we look to try to shore up um, multilateral institutions, we are in the year of the summit of the future to be held in September at the general assembly in New York. Um, an effort long plan to try to strengthen our multilateral institutions. It's happening at a time when those institutions are even weaker when the first idea of the summit came up, but we have to look to the positives and the general assembly I think is one of them. Lastly, my my questions, um, the International Court of Justice is seized of this uh, region in two different ways. One, the, the Gaza situation. I, I, I'm not completely clear, and maybe somebody can help answer this as to whether or not the ICJ uh, is required or, or uh, is expected even to respond to the the one month report that it requested from the government of Israel, which I believe has been submitted, and and if it is, uh, if, if there are any thoughts on 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 what response it might give, if it's due to give a response, uh, and how that may may change things going forward. And the second question, also on the ICJ, um, the the question on, on the issue that the ICJ has been looking at now for more than a year of occupation. Um, I believe a ruling is expected later this year, if I'm not mistaken. Um, any thoughts on how that may change the, the equation for the political solution going, going forward? Thanks, Lorraine. Great. Thank you, Ben. Um, I'm going to ask Lenny if she wants to respond to the ICJ, the questions regarding the ICJ. Um, before that, though, I want to add to add a response to your question about your, your um, planned envisaged uh, conference with Egypt um, and offer a, a comment that is really a mediator's perspective um, linked to what Ben was saying earlier. Clearly, the, the, the immediate urgent humanitarian imperative is the humanitarian imperative to save lives. And that means raising funds and supporting UNRWA and the other relevant agencies. But I think also the politics of hope and the politics of vision are necessary to add to this equation so that we are looking both at the immediate and at the future. And that is important for our souls, for the Palestinian souls, for Israeli souls, for all of those of us that are working for peace. And echoing Ben, I think the real emphasis here in terms of the politics of hope and vision is not on substance. 
I think we played that uh, to death. I think we have all of us some broad understanding of what the substance might look like. The process is the more complicated question. And if we get our process right, we are much more likely to get the substance right for resolution of the conflict. And by process, I mean processes in the plural. It's the process at local level. It's the process at national level. It's processes at the regional level. And it's the processes at the global level. And bringing that into your focus provides something of a political segue from the urgency of the now to the possibility of a better better future. So for what that's worth, I, I hand back to you, Lenny. Thank you. Um, ben, to your question on ICJ, I'm not an expert, so I think I should refrain from providing uh, the answers to your questions, but I'm surely, I'm sure they're, they're, they're to be found. So um, this is important questions that we should all be uh, aware of. And um, uh, the power of the provisional ruling of ICJ uh, still stands. And I think it's now uh, a month uh, and we know uh, from observing developments on the ground that certainly uh, the um, uh, request to Israel to ensure humanitarian access hasn't been delivered on. I wanted to uh, just uh, provide a, a few comments reflecting on um, both Ali's and Ben's uh, uh, interventions. I think certainly, you know, it's easy to agree we are at, at crossroads and I think uh, you know, leading up to October, we were seeing over years a rapid deterioration of the situation on the ground. I was speaking about how UNRWA was um, um, increasingly struggled to survive and to try to avoid a, a financial collapse. Uh, but also we saw um, a, a dr drastic deterioration of the situation on the ground in the West Bank with the number of killings of you know, children and others went up and the number of settlements went up and we also saw the the what should i say the the, the increasing lack of uh, representation or legitimacy uh, on behalf of the palestinian authority so i think you know leading up to october everything was going in the wrong direction and many said immediately after 7th october maybe this is an opportunity for a change maybe this uh, can give us some new hope i think most of those who, who who raised their hopes in October have now um, uh, become more silent because we have been so disappointed, all of us that hope that this may provide for a change. So far, there are a few indications that it's a change in the, change in the right direction for the Palestinians, but, but the judgment is still out there. And for me, uh, not only you know do I think it's important that the Palestinian factions are meeting to try to, to find some sort of unity, I also agree it's very hard to be optimistic, but I think it's super important that we're not, you know, allowing the US and, the, uh, and Israel to fill uh, the space when it comes to the discussion around what will come after. And I also think that, you know, despite everything looking so, so incredibly difficult, I think, and I think Ben also alluded to this, uh, you know, there are countries who have not suspended uh, their uh, support to, to UNRWA. There are countries that have spoken up against, uh, you know, what they see as, uh, you know, blatant uh, disregard of IHL in Gaza. There are so many voices, and it, not at least is there a public sentiment growing in so many countries, uh, particularly in Europe, that, you know, we observe that particularly young people are taking to the streets and saying that they do not accept what is happening in Gaza and they demand some change. So I do think it, there is there is room for hope uh, and we have to maintain that hope. But if you analyze what is happening from day to day right now, it, it's, it's very hard to see the light at the end of the tunnel. Um, thank you. Uh, thank you, Lenny. And I, I, I hand to you, um, I think we're drawing to a close before we invite Christian to make concluding comments. So if there are final reflections you want to share with us, now's the time. I just want to say that, yes, of course, there is room for hope and change. And it's not a maybe, um, it is certainly uh, because the, the, the change or the moment uh, was really uh, major 
And if such a moment or if such tragedy cannot result in a major, major change, then what else would result in that? And this is why this one should not be let go. And change, hope, uh, don't happen, as we all know, don't happen very quickly. They, they take time. Just think of Europe over the past four months and just think of the, uh, the voting in the European Parliament yesterday. Yes, it took months of pressure on, on these parliamentarians to, to, uh, to adopt such a, uh, such a decision. So that uh, hope and change are important. But the third, ele the third element that makes both of them meaningful is accountability. If we don't have accountability, then it all will go in vain. If, if these hopes and these uh, changes will go will not go in the right direction if we don't hold the account of the actors accountable. So just to agree with you, uh, Laurie, you agreed with me earlier on a number of fronts, and I want to agree with you on uh, the right processes and the politics of hope and vision. Our investments need to be in the right processes. There have been so many processes, but now it's time to reflect on them and ask ourselves if they were really the right processes. If they were the right processes, they should have made us closer to peace and justice, but we're not. So then let's question these processes and let's take the political courage to ask the questions that we don't want to ask, you know, the hard questions that will really be very difficult to answer. I think this is the moment really to ask these questions and offer some answers to them. Thank you. You know, in this, in this context of such uh, terrible suffering and, and despair, Every one of the webinars that Prio and Croc have organized have filled me personally with such a sense of inspiration and hope. And it's remarkable to listen to the panelists, uh, your clarity, your insights, your wisdom, your courage, your persistence. There's a message in that in itself to our audience and to our students um, at Croc and elsewhere who are often often express a sense of fatalism or impotence um, when they're confronted with big global forces, um, powerful forces that are oppressive. And they say, what can we do? And really the response is, you have to do what you can do. And maybe what you can do, you know, if you're not in a position of authority and power is go and stand on the street and join the protest, calling for a ceasefire, calling for an inter-occupation supporting the organizations that are represented here and, and beyond, there is never nothing that can be done. And victory for justice and peace is never certain, but we don't attain it without struggle. And so don't give up, um, persist. I want to thank the, the panelists very much for giving us hope and giving us confidence. I salute what you're doing. And with that, hand over to my friend Christian for concluding remarks. Thank you, Laurie. In many ways, uh, that was a wonderful conclusion already, but I'll uh, I'll offer a few thoughts. Um, this has been an extremely rich discussion. I certainly learned a lot, and, and just like Laurie and others, I, in the midst of the despair of watching the situation, there is also hope in, uh, in the insights and the comments that you have all provided. Amongst the many, many things that uh, I take away from this discussion is when it comes to the humanitarian situation, which you describe in uh, very clear and uh, quite desperate terms, you still uh, remind us uh, consistently that the humanitarian situation is also about the politics. Uh, there is no way in which you can, in this situation, disconnect humanitarian solutions from the underlying structural and political conditions that has caused the misery. And I think we take that with us. Relatedly, I also take away from this discussion, and there was a beautiful interchange uh, earlier based on a last intervention in particular about peace. And uh, it reminds those of us who take pride in being peace researchers, that it's not a given that peace is a beautiful word. Peace can be a dirty word. And peace as a word is uh, not infrequently misused. And uh, I don't think that is unique to the Middle East. I don't think it's unique to the current situation. I think it's uh, something that 
Many of us have been watching with great concern over the past couple of decades in particular, uh, but it's not even unique to our millennium. It's something that goes much further back than that. But of course, the answer to that, which many of you underlined, is that peace without justice is not a peace. I also think more almost technically, but fundamentally important, the reminder that uh, when we look at solutions to the situation in the Middle East, we uh, have an enormous repertoire of uh, things that have been tried and tested, uh, and that one of the implications of that is that there is a lot to learn, but that the second implication is that we may have uh, more to gain by focusing on uh, design at the moment than focusing on substance because there is no, never going to be a silver bullet that's going to fix this situation with uh, a single stroke. And that brings me to uh, perhaps the most depressing uh, conclusion of the event, which does this Despite the flurry of diplomatic activity going on and everything that is being thrown up and everything that is probably being discussed behind closed doors, we all struggle to really see the seeds of uh, a solution in this uh, current conflict. I, I challenge you all to, 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 to let me know what you thought were the most promising ideas. And uh, I, I knew that was a challenging question and perhaps it was even unfair of me to ask it. But I do think it revealed that uh, that we are very far away from uh, a diplomatic scene at the moment, which is characterized by promising, constructive, forward-looking ideas. But I want to end on the very note that Laurie picked up on and that uh, Allah in particular emphasized, namely that uh, there is opportunity in crisis. And... Uh, just like Laurie, I also take enormous inspiration from uh, listening to each of the three of you, because uh, if there is one thing that you uh, teach us all, it is exactly that. Um, there is opportunity in crisis, and uh, we uh, should still have hope, and there is no other way than maintaining that hope and working on it, not as naive optimism, but as uh, strategic realism. Uh, to identify the opportunities and uh, this is one of so many conflict situations where quick fixes is absolutely unrealistic and even undesirable but where long-term thinking and uh, putting stone on stone and uh, moving forward creatively is what is needed but again thank you to each of our three panelists Ben, I'm sorry, Ben, I'm not even going to try your last name, but you've been with us twice, so I hope you'll forgive me and we welcome you back. Uh, Lenny, very good to have you with us tonight as a private person, but um, somebody with great insight who brings a lot to this conversation. And Allah, very nice to see you again. I uh, admire your uh, ability to uh, keep, a, uh, keep your cool and... Uh, your realistic optimism in uh, the midst of this crisis. And thank you also to uh, the Croc Institute for taking care of the technicalities and to my dear friend, uh, Laurie, for moderating so well. Uh, this is, as Laurie said initially, the third in a series of events that uh, the Croc Institute for International Peace Studies and my own institute, PRIO, has been hosting on the Gaza crisis. And uh, there will be more to follow. So please watch this space. Again, thank you very much for your insights and your participation this afternoon, this morning, depending on where you are. I look forward to follow up on this and I learned a lot. Thank you.